Okay, I hope everyone's had a good week um, and I'm looking forward to the three-day weekend. I hope you are as well for anybody who is able to have a weekend. Um, I know that we'll all be doing a bit of work for sure, um, but hopefully you have a little bit of rest time in between. So I think most people on the call will, might know me or should know me. My name is Bonnie Jean Mediasi. I work with USAID. I am a senior advisor for quality improvement on the care and treatment team. I'm gonna introduce the call, um, explain a few things, then I will introduce our two facilitators and explain how the call will work. Okay, so just first, so everyone is aware you are all auto-muted at the moment. If you have a question or any concerns, please feel free to put it in the chat and we will respond to those questions accordingly. Again, please remember that you can switch to message to the panelist, message to the panelist and attendees, or you can message privately to an individual. So um, it, for everyone's awareness, this whole session today is to walk through the guidelines on facility preparedness that I have previously shared with everyone and that I hope you've read prior to this session. So I wanna make it clear for everyone on the call that this is just to be an additional resource to anyone who needs it. This is not mandatory guidance. Um, it's, it's really important that every partner follows the provincial mandates and or guidelines that already exist around facility preparedness. This is meant to be supportive and not in contradiction to anything that you already know or have from your province or district. So again, please this, just know that this is meant to be an additional resource um, and it's written by a few specialists who have um, extensive experience in this area. As we're walking through the presentation, if there's reference to supplies or equipments that your sites might require, please note that each partner organization must understand that whatever they need to do must be within the parameters of the proposals, work plans, and funding that you've already received and received approval for. If you have anything additional that you would like to discuss, you must discuss it with your AOR for any approvals. I will follow that up again and say the same information at the end of the call. But again, it's important that you just know that you are fitting anything you need to do with your in your existing work plans that are approved, funding that is already approved. Okay, now I'd like to just introduce the speakers on the call. So the primary facilitator for today's training is Lynn Wilkinson. Ms. Wilkinson is a public health specialist with an MSc in public health from the University College London. Her specific expertise is in differentiated service delivery for both HIV and TB patients. She has set up and run HIV programs in rural and urban South Africa since 2005, including MSF's flagship Kailisha HIV and drug resistant TB project. She currently provides technical guidance on differentiated service delivery to sub-Saharan African country governments, global and local partners through the International AIDS Society Differentiated Service Delivery Initiative. She's an honorary researcher at the Center for Infectious Epidemiology and Research at the University of Cape Town and the World Health Organization HIV Testing Service Delivery and the South African National Differentiated Service Delivery Technical Working Groups. She also provided emergency response support to the Ebola outbreak in Sierra Leone in 2014 and 15, specifically setting up and managing holding centers and case management flow. Dr. Tom Boyles is an infectious diseases subspecialist currently employed at Helen Joseph Hospital, Johannesburg through ANOVA. He is a researcher at the University of Witzwatersrand and an associate professor at the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine. He is the past president of the Infectious Diseases Society of Southern Africa and a lead author of the Society Guidelines for both Acute Meningitis and Community Acquired Pneumonia. Dr. Boyle spent three months as a front lines responder to the Ebola outbreak in Sierra Leone in 2014 and 15. So now I will hand over now to Lynn um, to take us through the actual training. And again, please remember to post all of your questions and comments through the chat and we will respond there. Over to you, Lynn. Thanks, Bonnie. Good morning, colleagues. Um, thanks for joining us so early this morning. This morning, I'm gonna take you through a practical how to ready health facilities for COVID-19. Focusing mostly on primary healthcare facilities, but we will also briefly cover hospital preparedness. We have two hours, um, and so hopefully we will have quite a bit of time for questions and discussion at the end. 
Uh, we're not exactly sure how long the presentation will take, but we should have sufficient time. So please, even if uh, you want to discuss something, uh, keep it till the end and we'll go through it. Mm. Sorry, my slides aren't advancing. Just hang on a moment. Right. So why facility preparedness? I think we all know this, but firstly, it's to protect our patients from contracting COVID-19 infection. Secondly, and possibly most importantly, that we protect our healthcare workers from contracting COVID-19 in our health facilities. Thirdly, that we're able to allow facilities to continue to deliver health services. And we'll speak a little bit about this specifically because we have seen in Gauteng um, mixed messaging about which services should be provided. For a while, EPI wasn't being provided, and yesterday a new circular went out to make it very clear that EPI services should be continuing um, immediately. So there has been some mixed messaging uh, from the provincial authorities on what services should be provided, and we want to be able to continue providing those services through the COVID pandemic. And lastly, that we facilitate proper COVID-19 management at our health facilities including appropriate testing and referral. This aligns very nicely with the document which many of you have already read, which is the Nas National South African Response to Reduce Risk Among HIV and TB Patients within the, within the context of COVID-19 pandemic. And I'm not going to go through these seven objectives. I think everybody's read them. They were already circulated by Bonnie and colleagues to all the implementing partners last week. But they really focus on exactly the same aims as the ones that I've covered. Importantly, the top five priorities for HIV and TB identified by the National Department are accelerating decanting to external pickup points. Secondly, implementing multi-month dispensing for all chronic patients. Thirdly, rapidly scaling up tenofovir um, regimens in eligible art patients. Fourthly, strengthening facility infection control readiness, including infection control practices in the facilities. This has been broken down into implementing infection control practices within the facility and screening and separation of those with COVID symptoms fast-tracking vulnerable patients into the facilities, implementing chronic care service delivery points that are separate from COVID-19 screening, testing, and care points in open-air environments, and then fifthly, expanding community HTS, art, and TB services. Really, today, we're going to be focusing on priority number four and trying to provide some practical guidance um, on how to achieve set up in your facilities so that these uh, priorities can be achieved. I will be focusing right at the end also on how, if we set up our facilities properly, we're also able to um, support our PLHIV, our people living with HIV attending facilities. It supports diagnosing our TB suspects and TB patients attending our health facilities. And lastly, how we can adapt our differentiated service delivery um, at health facilities for our art patients. So let's start with um, getting into the detail. I want to, I'm going to use a lot of photographs during this presentation to show uh, what we mean, because sometimes I think a visual image is uh, easier to uh, uh, see what we mean by setup. So this picture was taken last week, Thursday, at Stratford Community Health Center in Orange Farm. I attended, uh, I'd never been to Stratford Community Health Center before, and when I drove up to Orange Farm, I really, really thought that I'd um, hit the taxi rank. And because Orange Farm is not really in lockdown, and that's even in compared to Soweto and Alex, where we also were training last week, there are many, many, many more residents out on the street. It seemed likely to me that I just interacted with a taxi rank until I drove closer and realized that it was the clinic. And there were probably some 500 to 800 or 900 patients standing outside the facility, clogging up the entire area outside of the facility. So it wasn't that the facility hadn't made efforts to prepare and set up, they had. They'd set up a sanitation station, they'd externalized their chronic management, and they'd reduced their non-essential service attendance. 
but hundreds of patients were thronging outside the facility gate with no social distancing. Sanitation that was being provided by the guard at the gate was also being clogged with five or 10 people rushing at the poor man to have, his hand to have their hands sanitized. All the primary healthcare chronic patients were waiting outside and were being serviced by robots who were coming outside, determining what chronic treatment they needed, going back inside to the primary healthcare external tent to fetch their file and get it scripted and then bring the treatment outside to the patient. All EPI and some acute patients were being refused entry and sent home. And I think most of all, the healthcare workers were extremely, extremely anxious, including the, the doctors in the facility who were getting to the point of not wanting to come to work. We then started the intervention and I'm going to go through the practical guide that's already been shared with you for how we set up the facility. And at the end of that, I'll explain what was actually involved, how much time and what we needed to do to change the facility around. So the basics of setting up all the primary healthcare facilities is to arrange the entire facility into what we call three zones. The first zone is the yellow zone, which is moderate COVID-19 risk. That's before triage has taken place. We don't know whether the patient has symptoms or doesn't have symptoms. All stations before triage, before first screening, are noted as yellow stations. All stations, once the patients have been triaged as having COVID symptoms, are orange stations, orange zone patients, we call that a high, the high-risk zone in the facility. And for all patients that do not have symptoms but may be asymptomatic, we call those blue zones in the facility. they low risk, although they aren't um, no risk. This is an important difference from what we had in the Ebola epidemic. Because in the Ebola epidemic, as soon as we screened someone negative, we knew that they were 100% safe and we could manage them within routine services without any additional IPC. That's not the case, as we all know, in COVID because the patients may be asymptomatic. And so IPC, even within the blue zones, within the routine services, remain extremely important. I'm going to go very slowly through each of the stations within each of the zones and how we set those up. I'm not going to go through PPE per zone. It is set out in the guide that we shared. The PPE for staff members and patients are set out very clearly per station, depending on whether it's a yellow zone station, an orange zone station, or a blue zone station. So this is an example of how the facility would be set up, and I will keep coming back to the slide. As you can see, as the patient comes in through the entrance of the facility, they're entering the yellow zone. At this point, we do not know if they've got COVID symptoms or not. They will pass a sanitation station, and then they will head to the first screening station. From there, they will then be separated forever while they're at the facility. They will either be managed in the orange high-risk COVID positive symptom section, or they will be managed in the blue, lower risk, no COVID symptoms, but may be an asymptomatic section. I will come back to the slide. So as you can see, this is a picture I took yesterday from at the facility um, during the support. And you can immediately see how the queues outside have changed from the picture of last week, Thursday. This stretches all the way in one direction and in the other direction, which I'll also show you. The most important thing for our facilities to understand is that outside is as important as inside. The risk of infection outside brings the risk of infection inside. And so as soon as we start um, not allowing patients in, letting patients in too slowly, not having a fast enough flow through, the more risk we create outside our facility, and once that patient then enters the gate, they pose an a higher risk for healthcare workers and other patients in the facility. So our single entrance means that in some facilities where patients were able to come from multiple entrances, this needs, the other entrances need to be closed. There should be only be one entrance into the facility. 
This we find quite difficult in facilities that allow patients to park inside. We saw this at Hillbrow CHC where some patients drive in and then enter um, into the facility buildings from the parking lot. That has been stopped, so no patients can drive into facilities anymore. They have to park outside. If there's anywhere where more than one entrance um, into the facility has been used in the past, all those entrances need to be closed. So really, there's only one entrance into the facility. That is through the gate, not into the building. We have seen some people, uh, some facilities understanding single entrance, meaning single entrance in into the facility building. Here we mean into the facility premises. There needs to be a designated official at the gate who controls entry into the gate. This is usually a security guard who needs to be a very active, uh, engaged member of the team. We've then allocated WOBOTs. Even community members have volunteered to support the queues outside the facility to make sure that people are observing social distancing. We have marked on the roads outside, the pavements outside, um, painted lines for one, um, spaced one and a half meters apart. In some cases, these um, lines go on for three, four, five blocks, one kilometer or one and a half kilometers to allow for that queue to be social distanced. We've seen if it's painted on the road, if there's a defined painting uh, marks all the way, patients are observing it with very little cue marshalling. Where we are just asking people to stand apart and it's not marked on the ground, it's not working very well. So cue marshals where they are in place outside are using loud hailers um, to just remind patients to stand on their line and move one line forward as they go through the gate. And the gate security uh, control is only allowing one single patient in at a time. The entry point into the facility cannot be the exit. We see this in almost every facility that we've supported, that most patients are entering and exiting through the same place. Now we know that in some facilities there is only one gate and perhaps one entrance for cars, and these then need to be split into, and we'll talk about this again, but into a single entry point in the middle and a blue, a blue exit on one side and an orange exit on the other side so that we're not having patients that are coming from orange crushing through the yellow patients as they're entering the facility. We really need to see them as one, way, one directional traffic. And though once you enter a traffic lane, you never turn around and reverse and go the opposite direction. Yeah, you can again see how the patients are now spacing themselves very well. All of, the, all of the information that I'm providing to you is also contained in the poster deck, which was also circulated, which has been done in English and Zulu. And these really help to put up at the various stations so that patients can read and staff can read is allowed at the particular station. Um, and and what should not be done. Here from our clinic entrance, very clear to follow and only coming through the gate when asked and that we don't enter, we don't exit through the same gate that we've entered. The patient then passes a sanitation station. This sanitation station cannot be at the gate entrance. It cannot be the security guard who is trying to sanitize people's hands. The security guard at the gate is only, his only task is to manage single entry one at a time through the gate roughly one to one and a half meters further in we set up our sanitation station so here you can see in this image very clearly that the lady has been asked to come through the gate she's been sanitized and only after sanitation then she is moving into the queue before the first triage station so th this summarize what, summarizes what I've already said. Short distance from your single entry point outside of facility buildings. The sanitation station should be run by a designated sanitation official. This can be a security guard, a lay healthcare worker, or an administrative staff member. In most facilities that we've worked with, they've, they've decided that the sanitation should also be a security guard. 
So we've got a security guard at the front gate letting people in and sort of a meter and a half in another security guard doing the sanitation. That guard will then look um, for the, the queue marshal that's controlling the entry through the screening station to see when that person can move on and making sure that flow works very well. At the moment, we have enough sanitation uh, sanitizer at our facilities, and so we're using sanitizer. We may get to the point, as we did in West Africa, where there is no sanitizer available, and we then need to mix the right concentrations of bleach and water. We have um, included in the annex the right amounts of bleach and water for hand sanitation versus disinfection based on the concentration. Um, the concentration in um, normal South African bleach. Uh, please note we see very frequently um, staff cleaning medical equipment with sanitizer, cleaning chairs with sanitizer, cleaning tables with sanitizer. It's very, very important for us to understand that sanitizer is not strong enough for disinfecting surfaces and that um, there's an understanding between the concentrations for hand sanitation and for surface disinfection. Then probably the most important station in the entire facility is what we call the first screening and triage station. Every single patient entering the facility must pass the first screening station. And the only way that you can make sure that you're not having patients missing the station is by putting it very carefully placed in a place where patients cannot uh, avoid going through it. This is an example of how it was set up in the Alex Community Health Center for anybody who knows that community health center. This is an example of how it's being set up in Chihuelo Community Health Center in Soweto. This is again at the gate, every single patient comes from the sanitation station and then um, queues in front of a screener. So again, this screening station should be located a short distance from your sanitation point um, outside the facility uh, buildings just inside from the gate where a position where all patients entering must pass the screening marshals or the from the first screening station we need because you need to make sure that people are queuing correctly from the sanitation station up to the triage station here people have taken different approaches Either they've allowed multiple queues in front of the triage stations, again, marked with crosses on the ground, or they've only allowed a single queue that then filters into each of the um, screening stations. Depending on the volume of your facilities, you need somewhere between three to five um, screeners at your first screening station. Uh, in all the CHCs, we have, we put four to, we put four up to six. Really, it's important that we get patients through the gate quickly. And so these screening stations have to flow very quickly. We find that the longer people stand outside, they less they adhere to social distancing because they become extremely frustrated. So the screening station, the first screening station and the quick flow through is really important. We have seen facilities trying to do too much at their first screening station. For instance, trying to assess HIV status or even trying to take um, SATs or temperature or taking a head count at that first screening station. We strongly discourage that because it slows the whole process down. By slowing the process down, there's more clogging outside the gate, um, causing an infection risk outside. All of the above, so um, uh, taking temperatures and SATs and taking head count can all be accounted for later in the facility and we'll discuss these as we go through. Really at the first screening station, it should only be doing the symptom screen and at, at a maximum marking that you've done a screen. Most of the facilities are having to report the number screened. So really we're just writing down the number, the number of the person coming through so we can count how many people were screened and then reflecting how many was um, triaged into orange and how many were triaged into blue. That's all we're counting at the screening station. The screening stations do not need to be run by professional nurses. Uh, we want to keep our professional nurses unless you have excess capacity uh, for the orange zone for testing. 
Uh, these screeners can really be uh, lay healthcare workers. We're using robots in almost all of our, all the facilities where we have um, set this up, or enrolled nurses or nursing assistants. They need to simply be trained on the symptom screen tool, and where possible, one of their supervisors um, managing all five of them in case they have questions. So here you can, uh, let me first maybe just show you the picture and then we can go back. So here you can see on the ground, the screeners placed, there's five screeners. This is again at Stretford Clinic in Orange Farm. No patient is able to really pass without passing through a screener. It's very clearly marked on the ground where the patient must stand versus where the screener will sit. Some of the facilities are using tables. At Orange Farm, we're just using clipboards. We have on the ground, which you can't probably see very well, we have cloth masks that have been donated by the community. Every single patient that triages orange, so has COVID symptoms, is asked to take a mask and put it on before entering the orange section. We want all patients entering the orange section masked. If we had enough surgical masks, we would much prefer it that patients use surgical masks. Unfortunately, we don't and we need to make sure that all staff in the orange and yellow zones do have surgical masks on. So we are making sure that those patients at least wear a cloth mask. Where you do have capacity to provide surgical masks, that would be better for the orange patients. And let me just check what, uh, if I've left anything else. Ideally, this would be undercover. At the moment, we haven't had enough gazebos to put these staff undercover but really it does get extremely hot during the day for screening, although that might change as winter comes upon us and perhaps our screeners will actually be cold. So we at the moment are um, uh, changing them in, on a shift basis. Where facilities have had extra gazebos, they are using them to cover the screeners, but really any capacity to provide shade for the screeners is really helpful. The other real problem that we've observed and we'll talk a little bit about is that this whole setup of the yellow section where we pass through the gate slowly through sanitation and then through the first screening station only really operates until 4 p.m. This is a problem in the community health centers that are actually running for 24 hours. Uh, we then move the triage station um, directly in front of the emergency unit's door and make sure that a staff member is allocated to continue to triage um, at night in the emergency department, making sure that any uh, patient with symptoms is immediately sent to um, or taken to the isolation room within the emergency department. We'll talk a little bit about that later when we cover our hospitals, but community health centers that have emergency departments are run like the first stage of the hospitals, which we'll cover a little bit later. Okay, this is what we're using for our first symptom screen. We're keeping the questions extremely uh, limited. And as I said, we are not doing any SATs or temperatures at the first screening station, nor are we doing head counts. We are asking patients whether in the last 14 days, two weeks, they've developed any one of the symptoms, which I'm sure most people on this group know, but essentially a cough or fever or shortness of breath or sore throat. We've also asked if patients have a significantly worsening chronic cough. Uh, this uh, hopefully for our TB patients that have been coughing for longer than two weeks and their cough has not got worse, we would be screening them as negative so that we make sure that we're not screening existing TB patients that are already on TB, TB treatments into our blue zone. And then the last uh, question, which we are asking is whether the person has very suddenly lost their sense of taste or smell. Any, any answer to any of the above as positive screens the person into orange. As I said before, all orange patients will immediately be given a cloth mask um, and asked to put it on themselves and then will be directed towards the orange zone. All patients that screen negative, which means they don't have symptoms, but they could be asymptomatic, are then directed into the blue zone. The blue zone is routine services. And as much as possible, we want to continue using the existing services for all, um, for all 
parts of the health service, antenatal, chronic, acute, EPI, MCH, so that those part of the services can continue for our patients without symptoms. We'll carry on talking a little bit more about the blue, the blue zone a little bit later on. This is our poster that's up at our first screening station. I'm now going to show you a short video of the, the yellow zone. So as people are coming through the gate, how the, the, queue, the queue system works, how the lines on the ground work and how the screening works. Unfortunately, this was taken um, only on the first day of us running it. So it's not as perfect as it was yesterday. But just to give you an idea of the markings on the ground, who's controlling the cues and how they flow through. Okay, hang on. Sorry, I'm just having to start the video, which is maybe not as easy as I thought. Sorry, I've got the wrong view. I'll be with you now. Go up to Chronic Ma, up there. Sorry, I was going to turn up there. Off, but I don't seem to be able to do that. Yeah. Okay, from the first triage station, everybody then gets screened into either orange, so positive, COVID symptom, positive for COVID symptoms, or blue, negative for COVID symptoms. Some facilities, um, Hillbrow CHC and Alex, uh, where, where Tom Boyles is working, which we'll talk about a little bit later, have decided to for the patients to even take a a colored sticker which has been um, procured at the facility and uh, put on the, on the patient's uh, shirt so that it's possible to see that every single person that is in the facility has been triaged and whether they are then in the correct zone. We want to make sure that once you've been triaged orange, you will never be found in the blue zone. Similarly, a patient that has been triaged blue will never be found in the orange zone. That is easier if people have a sticker on there marking that, especially for very convoluted, complicated facilities. But where our orange zone is very clearly um, kept separate and close to the gate, then it is very easy to control that the orange patients do not move out of the orange zone and that the blue patients do not enter the orange zone. So going back to our original map of the health facility as previously explained, I'm now gonna move on to the orange section. The orange section is the high risk section. This is where people with COVID symptoms are referred into. They do not enter into the routine services, into the blue side. Initially, when we started working, we were very worried that because there's a very, um, there's a number of symptoms that we're looking for, that we, we, we would have a lot of patients in our orange zone. But actually we're finding even in these very busy facilities where we're seeing 500 to 900 patients a day, we are only really triaging somewhere between 20 to 30 patients into orange, which has been very manageable up until this point. We have to continue evaluating um, how, how manageable the orange section will continue to be. The first station in our orange section is what we call the second screening and management station. This is really the heart of the orange zone and is, and is ideally kept external to the building. But I'll, I'll talk a little bit through this. We're also calling it in some facilities the temporary chest clinic. This is because that's what it was originally called when some facilities already started to set up an external section for managing patients with COVID symptoms. This section is ideally a large tent in your CHCs and a slightly smaller tent in your primary healthcare clinics. We haven't as yet been able to, um, to get a large tent up at the, at the CHCs, although they have been ordered. And so what we've used as a temporary plan is three gazebos uh, put together as shown on this slide and then kept open in the middle. 
so that, um, that our patients can sit there waiting for services. If we don't have a large tent, we can use a row of gazebos. Alternatively, we can use a cordoned off area outside under cover. Some facilities have a separate building that's not being used, for instance, a, a hall or some other potential part of the service that has been closed that can be used and set up as the orange zone. And then I attended a very nice um, primary healthcare clinic, a new one, where it had a completely separate wing and it was able to be closed off from the rest of the facility service and that was then set up as the orange section. Ideally, we want it outside in a large tent or in a row of gazebos to ensure really good ventilation uh, for the entire time that you're in the orange zone. The staffing for the orange zone is extremely important. Critical staff is a clinician, either a doctor or a nurse, who will be managing, assess, screening, assessing, and managing all the patients that enter the orange zone. This is really where we will start taking our temperature, SATs, respiratory rate, deciding which patients need to be tested, and providing the routine services that the patient needs. Very importantly in this section, we need an allocation of what we call patient navigators or runners. Really, probably the best word for them are runners. We're using mostly robots and community health workers at the moment. These staff also occupy or stand around the outside of the tent, which I've shown you. And the clinician uses these patients in a number of ways. When a patient is sent from the triage station, the yellow triage screening station, they see the patient coming and they receive the patient. So the patient knows exactly where they need to go and doesn't wander around the orange section potentially into the testing tent. They receive the patients, they put them in one of the chairs in, that, um, in the orange tent, and they are then available for the doctor should the doctor need any support for that patient. That means including running into the facility to fetch a folder, running into the facility to fetch a blood result, um, taking a script to the pharmacy to get the treatment for the patient, taking the script to the chronic, um, the chronic services to get patients art refills or hypertensive refills. So really they are the people that move within the facility to support the patient and the patient does not move within the facility. These people are really, really important. They also, once the patient has, needs to go to testing, are escorting them to the testing tent. And once the patient has finished testing, are escorting them out of the facility through the orange exit so that they do not enter the blue part of the facility and they do not exit through the yellow entrance. Additional staff, if at all possible, is to have a permanent cleaner allocated to this tent. We'll talk a little bit more about why. And an administrative clock for um, headcount or for opening file, for opening temporary files. However, we are at the moment in most of the facilities managing the headcount in the orange section and the files through the clinician. The clinician is um, adding them to their uh, list of patients seen and also completing a temporary file for the patient that will then be inserted um, at the registry after the patient uh, later, later on. The station is set up with uh, chairs one, at least 1.5 meters apart. It needs to be painted on the floor so that everybody knows where those chairs need to be placed and they do not move. Patients are seated on a seat. They do not move forward in their seats as the queue moves forward. They stay on their seat. Every time a patient vacates their chair, the chair has to be disinfected. At the moment, most uh, the robots that are allocated as runners in this tent are making sure that those chairs are disinfected between each patient. Some of our um, model CHCs, the patient, when they've got folding chairs, the patient is actually taking their chair with them when they go in and see the clinician. They then carry, take their chair with them all the way to testing, and only once they've completed the whole orange zone is their chair disinfected and brought back into this orange tent. So extremely important that no patient moves chairs without disinfection. Um, and so we don't use the normal approach of moving chairs. We also don't put benches into the orange zone because those are extremely difficult to make sure that people do not move up on the benches. The clinician will then be placed within the front of the orange section, ideally behind a screen, as you can see in this picture. This is our clinician. She's stationed behind in the front part of the gazebo. 
she comes to the door and makes sure that the next patient comes through. She doesn't sit at her desk and call for the next patient, ensures that the correct patient comes through to her, ensures that her surfaces have been disinfected between patients. She will have all the necessary equipment with her. At the moment, we are making sure that she's able to um, take, a, a take SATs, ideally with a mobile oximeter, um, which are just the small devices that are very easy to disinfect between patients. She's taking temperature using a temperature strip or an infrared thermometer, and otherwise she's using very limited equipment. We are unfortunately, although discouraging taking BPs, there are occasions when a BP needs to be taken. We're then using a manual cuff and making sure that it's disinfected between patients, but really trying to keep that to a minimum. Yeah, you can see um, this is the doctor from the facility who would normally be sitting in the OPD. One doctor is allocated uh, per, per morning shift and afternoon shift to be managing the orange tent. She's also responsible for making sure that the runners and everybody in her zone is aware of their duties and tasks, and she's able to manage the patients through the orange zone. I'm gonna take you very, I'm not going to go through the entire algorithm of what this doctor does, but highlight for you the five important um, steps to the screening assessment and management within the orange tent. In short, she's comprehensively managing this patient. By the time she, she or he has finished managing this patient, this patient does not need to go anywhere else in the facility. This is really important. Everything that needs to be done for this patient is going to be done within the orange tent within the orange main screening and management zone. The first thing she's gonna assess is severity um, by using the respiratory rate, uh, SATs, um, oxygen saturate, uh, saturation, temperature, et cetera. We put in the guide what the ranges are. And if um, those ranges are not met, if they're outside the ranges, then she will immediately refer either to her emergency department, if she has an emergency department and the patient will be transferred to the isolation room within the emergency department, or patient transport will be ordered for that patient so that patient can be taken to hospital. That will be the end of her management of that patient. She will not try to test a severe patient. She will not try to provide any other service, but make sure that that patient is transferred as quickly as possible. Thereafter, for all the mild and moderate uh, patients, COVID symptom patients. The first thing she'll do is determine whether the patient needs to be tested for COVID. As we know, in terms of the new uh, testing criteria, all the patients that we've sent through to the orange zone, except for those that have lost their sense of taste and smell, will, will need a test. Uh, we are hoping that the, having discussed it with the team writing the management guidelines that very soon taste and smell will be included. That's not the case at the moment. All of those patients will need to then be counseled by the clinician on the importance of home isolation, and they will be provided with a patient information leaflet, setting out what that means in their own language so that they're also able to read it and discuss it with their families when they arrive home. We've, we're experiencing from having done this, that patients are coming through from the first triage station, that don't need to be tested, even though uh, they might have displayed or might have reported one of the, the symptoms up front. And so it's really important for this clinician to essentially do the screening that's done at the first screening station, again, more comprehensively with clinical skills and deciding then who needs to be tested um, after attending the screening and assessment tent. So as I said, she'll move on to home isolation and patient um, uh, giving them a patient leaflet. Then very, very importantly, she will determine their HIV status. This is extremely important because we need to know who to um, send for TB testing because TB is obviously our most common uh, differential diagnosis from COVID. And so we need to really be focusing on um, doing our TB diagnosis. In fact, at this time in the pandemic, we probably still have more TB cases coming to our orange, new TB cases than we are having COVID cases. So she needs to determine the HIV status. Either they already know their HIV status. If they're positive, she makes sure that they then also deliver a TB sputum. 
If they don't know their status, she needs to direct them for immediate HIV testing. We set up, which I'll go to, we set up an HIV testing tent within the orange section so that there's a tester immediately available to test these patients and then send the result back to the doctor so that the doctor can assess whether the patient needs a TB sputum taken. She will then move on to determine the reason for their clinic attendance in the first place and where she, she determines that it's essential, then she will manage the patient at the orange zone. When I say essential, I mean that obviously this is something that cannot wait 14 days. Ideally, if it's something not very um, critical or not very important, uh, the patient can be asked um, to, do, to test, home isolate, and once they're um, symptom-free, they don't have symptoms, they then could refer, come back to the facility. Examples of things are for this are somebody with a toothache, um, and many, many other examples that we're finding of patients that don't really need to be prioritized for routine services today, but could come back to our facilities for routine, routine services once they don't have symptoms and pose less risk to the healthcare workers and other patients at the clinic. However, many of the patients do need attendance. Um, they might need their chronic medication. They might be unwell. And we had a patient yesterday with really bad tonsillitis, et cetera, et cetera. And in that case, the doctor will then manage the patient, uh, write a script for the patient, send a runner to the pharmacy to collect the medication that the patient needs. And, um, and then the patient will be escorted out of the facility. We also find that sometimes this uh, clinician is not able to provide a specialized service. In that case, the runner will fetch a clinician from a specialized service. So I'll give you an example, and that has been quite commonly uh, dentistry in the CHCs where they have dentists available. The dentist will then come and see the patient in the orange zone and determine whether the patient needs um, to be transferred to dentistry or not, or whether the, the dentist can manage the patient within the orange zone, which would be preferable. I'm not going to through, go through the clinical algorithm, but this essentially sets, uh, uh, sets out in much more detail what I've just gone through um, for the clinician, exactly the steps that they will follow within the orange tent to make sure that all five Pieces of, the, pieces of the clinical algorithm are followed for the patient. Here I show you the um, government's uh, current uh, patient information leaflet on the importance of isolation. It's a three-page leaflet. We're having uh, ANOVA is kindly printing those uh, for the Johannesburg facilities, and these are really useful um, to have on the clinician's table, and every patient is given one so they understand the need for isolation when they go home with explanation of, of what that means. Hopefully, we'll also be able to provide this in local languages. This is our poster for our COVID-19 screening and management station. Again, highlighting that patients keep their masks on at all times, that they wait in the chairs allocated to them, that they don't sit in a chair unless it's been disinfected, and they only move um, to stations as directed by their healthcare workers. This is our orange zone HIV testing uh, tent. This is set up with an HIV tester in the tent so that they can carry out that test immediately. There was some discussion at the facility that I was at yesterday as to whether we could use HIV self-tests in the orange um, zone. Uh, we had a facility meeting about it and decided that it was not feasible within the orange zone because we want to make sure that that patient is tested very quickly and sent back to the doctor so that the doctor can decide on further management, including um, sending the patient for a TB sputum. We have manageable numbers of people in the orange zone, and so the HIV tester is not fully occupied, um, and so it, would be pos it, it wouldn't really save any time, but would add additional time if we added a self-testing booth in the orange zone. Here you can see our arrangement of tents. I'll show you another photo of this more clearly, but the arrow here is pointing to an additional tent that's added onto the back of the orange screening and management station. This is what we call our specialized clinical service tent. This is for a patient that needs to see another clinician, not our generalist clinician in the orange tent. For, for example, if a dentist needs to come and see a patient or if a patient needs an antenatal assessment and the clinician is not able to do so, or if the patient needs to see a specific um, art nurse uh, 
for, uh, for slightly more complicated HIV management, that clinician will then come from the blue zone in the facility into this tent at the back. They do not go through the main orange tent, but enter this tent separately, and we'll see this one patient in that tent at the back, and then we'll return to the blue zone, obviously um, disinfecting in between, moving from the orange to the blue zone. Here we have our posters for our HIV testing station and for our specialized health service station um, for any patient that needs a specialized clinician. Then very importantly in our orange zone, we now move on to um, TB, TB and the TB and, TB and COVID-19 testing station, as you can see in this picture. This will be, um, this will be set up behind the orange screening and management station. No, all patients will, this will be their last station be, before they leave and go home. So they won't come out of the orange screening and management station, go for testing and come back to the doctor. The doctor will complete everything they need to do for the patient, including the runners fetching their treatment. And only once that has been completed, will they move to the testing station. And from testing, they will then exit the facility. I'll explain this in more detail. So as I've said, the, this testing station is located um, in, within easy access from the second screening and management station. It's the last station before you exit the facility. It's a separate well-ventilated tent or gazebo outside the facility. I'll show you a picture now. Who do we need in this? We need a testing clinician, either a professional nurse or doctor trained to take um, the swabs. In a very small facility, low volume clinic, this could be the same clinician that's running the second screening and management station if really the number of patients coming through is very small. What we found in the very busy um, clinics that with a lot of people coming through for testing, we need to also then allocate staff for completing the forms before people go through to the test. So we don't use the clinician to complete the forms, but we've been using robots that we've trained to complete the PUI form and the NHLS specimen form. So here you can see um, how we've set up at Orange Farm. Um, not all of the CHCs are using a three gazebo uh, approach. We had extra gazebos, so this is how we set ourselves up. Um, patients come straight from the second screening and management station to the form completion gazebo. In the form completion gazebo, we've got four robots um, who are completing their forms because this can take a long time. We're completing the contact list and this can take a long time for elicitation from the patient. Once the patient's forms have completed, they would then go into the left-hand tent, which is the sputum COVID-19 um, ventilated tent. It's open in the front and the back. It can even be open on an additional side. We've added an additional tent for our site here for donning and doffing of PE, uh, PPE, although this can just be done at a table outside the testing tent. I think we've already discussed this, but essentially at the moment, all the forms that need to be completed are the PUI form, which includes the contact form, the NHLS lab form, and we've also been required to fill an additional COVID-19 specimen form. I put that in brackets because there is some discussion about that requirement falling away. The patient will then move to the testing space. There, um, they will have COVID testing by the clinician. Um, and for those who've been asked for, uh, to be tested for TB, we'll also provide a sputum. What we've done, the, TB, the sputum can also be delivered in the same tent, or we have some extra outside space at Orange Farm behind the tent, um, in that big space behind, and so that's where people are delivering their um, uh, sputum sample. Importantly, and I think, again, most people on this call know this, but if a patient has a productive cough and can produce a sputum, they should produce two sputums, one for TB and one for COVID testing. We do not need to take a swab for a patient that can produce a TB sputum. In fact, that's um, the best uh, sample that we can have. Second, uh, second choice of sample is a nasopharyngeal swab, and the third is a oropharyngeal swab. 
at the moment we're trying to do nasal pharyngeal swabs on as many patients as possible, but it depends on which test swabs the facility is being provided with. Once we've taken a TB sputum, this T, the runner will take the TB sputum with the appropriate NHLS forms to the TB section to be completed in all of their registers, and then they submit it to the NHLS courier. The COVID specimen is packed at the COVID testing tent um, and then collected by the NHLS courier. We're taking dry swabs at the moment because there are, is no um, transport medium available in South Africa. And so these can just be kept in a cooler box or even just in a box. They don't need to be put on ice because they're dry swabs. Here's another picture for you that you can see here. This is Alex CHC. These are the patients uh, in fact, these are actually, we're also testing all the healthcare workers in the facility as per uh, the directive that healthcare workers should be tested. We're testing patients in the morning and once all the patients are finished, we're allowing healthcare workers to test. This is a queue of the healthcare workers at Alex CHC um, undergoing their tests after their forms have already been completed. These are the, the signage for the COVID testing uh, station, uh, form completion station and for the COVID-19 and TB testing station. All patients that come through the orange zone will then exit through the orange exit. This is very importantly means they will not go back out through the yellow entrance and they will not go out through the blue exit. At, um, most facilities, we only see a pedestrian gate and then a large car entry point or boom entrance. And that means that those two entrances then have to be clearly divided between the entry point and the two exit points. This usually means that the entry point in the, in the middle, the yellow will be in the middle and the blue on one side and the orange on the other side closest to those sets of services. I'm now going to show you another video to show how the tents, this will show you how all the tents have been set up in combination in the orange zone. Okay, lastly, moving on to the blue zone. The blue zone is your routine service. This is really your normal buildings that are being used for, for all your services, your antenatal, your acute, your pharmacy, your MCH, your chronic um, are all managed in the existing services. What we have added where facilities want to add this, so we mostly find this led by facilities, is an external, here we say art refill on the picture, but really an external chronic refill station so that the patients do not need to go into the main facility buildings. And we're able to then reduce the number of patients that are going through, for instance, to the art service to only those that need to be seen by the clinician. All those that are coming to the facility just for pickup will then be able to pick up from an external point. I'll show you this through the photographs. This is uh, the blue zone. As you can see, every single chair, and we'll go through this, has been, uh, every chair in the facility, every alternative chair has been blocked off to make sure that patients do not sit close together. Uh, we strongly believe that if we take symptomatic patients out by triaging them into the orange zone and managing them in the orange zone, it is possible for us to use our return services and existing facility-based buildings for all the other patients. And this really allows us to have a sustainable service over the next three to 24 months while we're dealing with a COVID pandemic. Many of the facilities have taken very short-term action plans that are unlikely to be sustainable in the long term, where they've moved, for the instance, the entire service out, outside of the facility buildings um, bringing all their nurses out and we're just not sure that this is maintainable over the long term or through the winter months. However, the blue station still needs some thought um, to ensure social distancing. We also want to make sure that the patients don't attend too many service points, so reduce as many service points as possible and limit the amount of time that the patient is spending in the facility. Yeah, that's pretty much that. Okay, I'm just going to show you a few photos of how we've done this in, um, in facilities. So this is the registry where they've blocked off seats. This is the OPD. You can see by the seat, oh, I want to go, all the seats have been marked like this within the OPD service. And this allows, this means that patients have been much better 
uh, at sitting space depart. So you can see this is the OPD space waiting for doctors and professional nurses, uh, patients with acute problems. We've marked throughout the facility the one directional uh, patient flow so that you don't go back out the same way you came in, but uh, follow the exit courseway um, to the exit gate for the blue zone patients. This is the uh, Blue Zone Chronic Refill Pickup Station that's been set up. This is on the other side of the facility's parking to the Orange Zone. The patients come through the gate and then uh, you can't, in that section at the back behind the gate, which is where the generator is kept, patients are queuing in that section to wait for their chronic refills. Um, so they come in through the gate, they get sanitized, they get triaged, they go straight to... Uh, this holding section behind the, uh, behind the fence, wait over there and then are seen individually for their refills, uh, where they then immediately exit the facility, not having gone into the facility building at all. This is your poster for the routine facility services. And this is our uh, poster to indicate that people should only exit through the blue exit. Okay, so th that's really taking you through the guide, uh, fairly quickly through the slides. Um, I want to just focus on why this is also very important for uh, people living with HIV attending facilities, and that if we set up our facilities in this way, we're protecting, um, protecting our PLHIV and our ART patients. Firstly, we're triaging them and separating our people living with HIV based on COVID-19 symptoms as per the the guidance from the national department. We're protecting our people living with HIV from infection while they're at the facility. We're ensuring that HIV testing is taking place, especially for those in the orange zone that are symptomatic. We're prioritizing TB screening and diagnosis. In fact, we're putting uh, equal importance on TB screening and diagnosis as we are on COVID screening and diagnosis. Um, for many years, we've try tried to screen every single patient who comes into a facility for TB symptoms, and we've never been very good at it, but the system allows us to do that. We're ensuring appropriate assessment management um, and access to treatment for people living with HIV with COVID symptoms or TB symptoms in a safer clinic environment, and ensuring routine service delivery for all people living with HIV that don't have symptoms while they're visiting our service. We also obviously already have existing differentiated service delivery models within our facilities. I'm not going to talk about the community models, but within our facility services, we're making sure that patients that have got um, symptoms for COVID are managed uh, separately from those that don't, but that they also get in quick access to their treatment through that orange tent and making sure that they investigated for TB um, while they're in the orange zone. For our blue patients, um, who are in facility-based DSD models, so patients that don't have symptoms but could be asymptomatic. We're making very sure that they are um, observing social distancing while they're waiting for their treatment. We're ensuring where possible that they can collect their art refill at an external pickup point or through a fast lane pickup um, within the facility building. And we're making sure that those that need their art clinical rescript or viral load are able to flow through to the art service clinicians and be seen there um, as, they, as they used to be. So I want to pause here and talk about how we've been able to set this up and how long it's taken and how much technical support is actually required to uh, achieve what, what is possible. You saw the pictures from before and now you've seen the pictures to after. And this has essentially taken us somewhere between two and a half and three days of technical support. We've identified what we call model community health centers. So community health centers that we want to turn into a good model. We then provide two to three hour on-site training at the CHC and we invite all the primary health care that feed into that CHC to the training. That training is again very practical. We stand outside, we go through the theory, and then we walk around the facility together and talk about exactly how we would set it up at the CHC. We then focus on ensuring with partners and with provincial government that we're able to uh, acquire the equipment needed, specifically tables, chairs, PPE, and test kits. 
We then allocate a single day where everybody's on board, the facility team and the, the technical support um, to set up the station with the, set up all the stations with the facility staff and sit with a facility manager to allocate duties for each station. And then we really support 1.5 days of running the patient flow with a facility team, being there, making sure it's working, making sure all the stations understand what they're doing, making sure that um, all, all of it flows well. At the end of each day of this three-day process, we review um, and continue to obtain buy-in from staff, build consensus with staff, uh, find solutions for places where we uh, have challenges and implement those uh, changes. We intend to, going forward now, we've spent the three days, we've set it up, we're happy that it's um, functional, that staff have been allocated to continue running it, and we will continue to pop in um, for short support monitoring visits over the next few weeks. How do we scale this from the, the model community health centers that we've set up to the primary health care clinics? The primary healthcare clinics have attended the training and we really encourage them to then go back and set up their facility as best as they can. Once, they, once we've set up the CHC as a model uh, facility, we bring the PHCs back and take them through um, on a tour so that they can have a look at it and see how they might go back and um, adjust their setup. The PHCs then go back and adjust their setup and then we are able to provide a very short technical support visit, an hour, an hour and a half, um, to go around with the facility manager and the lead clinician and possibly the OTL from that um, smaller primary care facility to check on how they've set it up and provide some input on any adjustments that need to be made. I'm now going to go um, into hospital setup. I'm not going to go extensively into hospital setup. There is a uh, video which we've provided you with a link on two in two slides time that goes through in detail every station within hospital setup. So please watch the video. But essentially you can see it, the, the first eight stations are exactly the same as we've set up for primary health care. And then they have three additional stations which, say, uh, which explains the setup, the location, the setup, the PPE, and the procedure for the emergency department, for the COVID ward, and for the non-COVID ward. This diagram very briefly explains the concept. So again, even your emergency department is going to be split into blue and orange. Your orange is your isolation section within your emergency department that's dedicated to patients with severe COVID symptoms where they will be clinically managed. Once they've been tested, they will be then moved to the COVID, uh, COVID ward. The COVID ward, however, has to really have a separation of space between patients that don't know their results yet, so PUIs. And while the patient doesn't know their result, they have to be in either separate rooms or separate cubicles, not sharing bathrooms or toilets until we know their test results. Obviously, if they are negative, then they will leave, um, become blue patients and um, enter the main um, uh, wards of the hospital for non-COVID patients. If they receive a, co um, a positive confirmation of COVID, then they can be moved into a group ward with other COVID patients and they can then start to share bathrooms. That's really the basic concept, but please, uh, we have set it out in the additional guide and you can also watch this video, 20 minute video by Dr. Tom Boyles that goes through this exact setup within a hospital setting. So I'd like to acknowledge my colleagues that have helped me work on the guide, Dr. Tom Boyles and um, Professor Shabir Musa, Dr. Madeline Muller. Also acknowledge Professor Richard Cook at WITS who's been helping uh, train facilities with us and also set up uh, one of the model CHCs. We'd like to thank the teams from the six model CHCs that over the last three days have been working extremely hard in Johannesburg to make sure their facilities can be used as model sites for other facilities to come and observe. And then we'd like to also thank um, um, those helping us with the poster design and the slide support. For, in case you don't have them, you can um, access the guides at these links. 
and you can access the posters both in English and Zulu are at the links on the right hand side of your screen. So that was very long. Um, thank you very much for listening to me and I think we can now move on Bonnie to discussion questions. Um, Dr. Tom Boyles is also now on the panel for more clinical, uh, clinical related questions. So please fire away. Thanks so much, Lynn, for that. Um, it was a great presentation and thank you for all the photos. I think they were very helpful. Um, also, so everyone on the line is aware, we will be sharing all of these materials and slides and the recording from this session um, online later today. These will be available to you as well. So with that, um, Lynn, Tom, and Anna, I would like to work with you to kind of just go over the Q&As that have been raised so far. I know that Tom has answered many of them, um, but I do think it would really be helpful if we talked through them, as not everyone might be following on the Q&A itself. So I'm not sure, Tom, if you want to start going through the questions and answers as you've already responded to them, and then the open questions that have not yet been responded to. Tom, are you there? Hi, I'm just, sorry, I'm just unmuting. I was just finishing typing some questions. Um, yes, so Bonnie, what do you, do you want me, I've typed, I've only about four questions left. Do you want me to go through back to the answered ones or, or what do you want me to do? I think if we can start with the answered ones and just verbal them so that everyone on the call hears them if they're not keeping up with the q and I think that would be helpful. Sure. I think as a second step, if we can respond to the open questions and as a third step, if we can go to anyone who has raised their hands and allow them to ask their questions. Sure. Thank so you. the first question wasn't really a question. It was uh, a comment about um, patients not understanding what fever is and um, accept that, that point. And that's part of the reason that um, screening, and the yellow screening is done by community health workers. And the second, the second screening where we can come up detailed questions and get to the bottom of what the problem is. And it comes up in a question further down that it may be that some pa that a patient gets into the orange area and is, is determined at a later point that they're not actually a PUI. Um, what happens to patients who need to register a file? So as I've said, um, as the patient must not enter the blue zone and the patient must not touch a file. But around that, you can make a plan for opening files using a runner. You may have to go and get the file. And in some clinics, they've used a clock in the orange zone to, to open files. So uh, record keeping has been slightly variable between facilities, um, but it is possible to open a file um, in the orange zone as long as the patient doesn't touch it. Um, severe respiratory distress. So as time goes on, we're expecting people to come to the clinic, perhaps on foot, um, um, or, or not, and be severely ill. So we are setting up, in, in all of the clinics that we've been to, we've set up an area in the orange zone with a couch and oxygen, and obviously uh, tubing and masks to keep people comfortable. So, um, and we've also d discussed um, purchasing oxygen concentrators for clinics that may not have oxygen, but yeah, essentially we would like to, yeah, the, the ideal is to have an area with oxygen for those patients while they're waiting for an ambulance. Um, sorry, just going up. going up. At what point do we now triage very ill patients and how do we do that? So, yeah, I think I've tried to answer that. Um, there were, if it, essentially, in, in practice, you need to keep an eye on the orange seated area um, and even the queue outside, if uh, the long queue outside, if you have um, people who can do that to the queue that could either decide the facility if someone looks really really terrible um, and it's good to have someone with some clinical experience if, if that's possible um, and then secondly in the, the seated area for orange then again it's mission to be able to pick out an obviously unwell patient and fast track um, otherwise the triaging is happening there will be patients with so-called silent hypoxia
at all. Um, but those patients, if they look well and they're walking and talking, then we're not going to be able to pick them out particularly early. The standard social distancing is 1.5 meters. touch the person next to you. So that's what, what people say standard. Um, is everyone in orange a PUI? I slightly covered that, not necessarily, because um, the yellow screening is a relatively rapid. By a, it may be determined that they're not a PUI, um, when more detailed history is taken. And um, also the national guidelines currently don't include the loss of taste and smell. However, we're pushing hard for that to be included in the national guidelines. So most people who make it to orange will be a PUI and uh, eligible for a test, but a, a few won't. Uh, should the, the doctor or the nurse do the HIV testing in orange zone? No, um, the model uh, is to have a gazebo in the orange zone with um, community health, health worker led testing. Uh, and clinics should have this um, simply as community health workers are not uh, are not out in the um, communities right now. So that's what can I just be done. Can I just add to that, Tom? Yeah. So I think it depends a little bit on your volume of your facility. For the bigger facilities, we definitely need a separate HIV testing gazebo. Um, if really the volume that's coming through to your orange tent is because you're a really small facility, then it would be possible for the clinician to do the HIV test. It really depends on volume. I mean, you know, we're seeing, uh, we're probably seeing somewhere between 20 and 30 patients coming through to Orange Zone in the bigger CHCs. It's not possible to do HIV testing within that. But if you really are only a small facility and you're seeing two or three or four, then it, pro it, it probably would be possible. Great. Do you want to move on to the second question about self-testing? Because that's your area as well. Yeah. So on self-testing, I mean, I briefly covered it, but we can talk about it again. We, we had a discussion about it at Orange Farm yesterday um, and decided that it didn't make sense to do self-screening within the orange zone because we really needed, we needed to do the test quickly and get the results so that we could do both the TB, uh, uh, TB testing and the COVID. So in orange, we would prefer a tester um, because you need a tester anyway to do the confirmatory testing. And this tester isn't that busy that they, um, that they need to, you know, to triage. Uh, but we did think that it would be possible to use HIV self-tests within the blue zone, really to encourage testing of uh, the blue patients coming through because we still want to <clears throat> make sure all the, that all of our patients um, are, uh, uh, are tested for HIV and get, and get onto ART if they're not on art within the blue zone. So we did think that we should set up HIV self-testing within the blue zone, um, facilitated, facilitated then by the uh, setup of HIV testing that already exists in the blue zone. Okay, great. Um, what, on average, how much time does it take to see a case in the orange zone? Um, I've answered 10 minutes, obviously that's variable. Um, the, the patient needs to take a history, do some vital signs and then, they, and then then it's a little bit variable, but, but um, we, we've had not had a problem with the volume so far at any of our clinics, um, seeing the patients, at the, at, even at these large CHCs, as Lynn said, um, I'm at Alex, where there are 700 patients a day coming through, only about 20 are, are going into the orange tent right now, and that's easy, easily manageable with one person right now. How often should orange stations be disinfected? That's a very good question. Um, I, we, we, we've had a challenge with cleaning, but we really need a dedicated cleaner for the orange zone. Um, so one area, are the, one thing to think about is the chairs that patients are sitting on. Um, uh, a solution that we came up with at Alex was that the patient will take their chair with them right through the orange zone. So there's, the chairs are, are sitting there, they pick it up, they take it to see the clinician. If they go for an HIV test, they take it. If they go for uh, ANC, they take it. And if they go for a COVID test, they take it. And then at the end, they leave the chair by the testing area and then they leave. And then those chairs are, can all be cleaned in one go and brought back to the start again. And that actually um, works quite well. Otherwise, you have to, every time the patient moves from zone to zone, someone has to clean their chair. 
and the chair, for example, with the clinician in the orange zone has to be cleaned between each patient. So there are practical ways of minimizing this. Uh, the desks um, need to be cleaned frequently, ideally between each patient, and then hand hygiene is, is obviously absolutely vital. So cleaning needs to be very thorough in the orange zone with a dedicated cleaner. Yeah, and maybe just to add, uh, add to that, there does seem to be a misconception at facilities about gloves. I think it's our biggest problem um, that uh, staff are hand, using hand sanitizer to clean their gloves, which is ineffective and they can't use disinfected because it breaks down the glove um, components. So where, um, for instance, runners that are, move, are taking a file um, uh, and moving between orange and, uh, orange and blue zones, uh, we're disencouraging um, the use of gloves and making sure that they're hand sanitized between every single step in the process. Uh, but we do just need to make very sure that our staff understand that hand sanitizing their gloves is not effective. Yeah, that's a very important point. Um, what about facilities that don't have enough space? Uh, this is a difficult question to answer. Um, without actually visiting a, a, a clinic and I think it, I think it also there's another question we can answer at the same time which is uh, lower down which is about whether you can use the inside of a clinic so um, and I think probably Lynn would be also good to answer this question every clinic is different and that you're going to have different challenges I can imagine that at a for perhaps a very urban clinic that has no car parking facilities it's going to be very challenging to do an, an outside orange zone um, all the facilities we've been to so far, we've, we've been able to do it. And that is quite urban, but it's not often in the very center of town, but we've always managed to do that. Um, you can use the inside of the building if your building is set up in such a way that you can split people into orange and you can move people into one area of the building and then out a door and out um, onto the street without coming into contact with blue, then you, the orange zone can be the inside of a building. Um, like I say, every every facility is different, and so uh, we have to make sensible plans based on what's in front of us. Perhaps then would comment on that. Yeah, I, I have been. Um, last week and this week, we've been training uh, many, many facilities, and we, so we have seen a, a great variation. Obviously, your smaller primary healthcare clinics don't need as many gazebos in their setup. So that helps because um, some of the, the gazebos can be... Uh, you, you know, you don't need a you don't need a separate station for form filling in. You don't need three tents for your orange zone. You probably don't need an additional tent for your specialized service. Some of those can be integrated where you've got low volumes of patients. Uh, we have seen uh, one or two primary healthcare facilities that have one um, room that has access from the outside, so they and then is able to be closed from the inside. So they have used those. Um, for the clinician consultations for the orange patients. Yeah, so it really, it really depends on what the facility setup is. The local authority in Johannesburg has got some very small clinics and I've been discussing it with their manager. They are, some of those facilities are next to or very uh, closely attached to some sort of hall um, and they are setting up the orange zone in the community hall that is next to or attached to the clinic. So there really are a great variety of options. Um, I think that probably similarly to the next question about en entrance and exits, it's it's uh, it, it's a it's a question of doing the best you can within the facility that you've got. And if you if you literally have one door and in and one door out, then that's what you have to use. But we've generally found that we can find an e extra exit points. We can um, uh, push p um, show people to pathways sort of on, in the grounds that so they don't cross over with each other, the blues and the orange. Um, so it can be a challenge, but generally we've been able to find solutions. Yeah, we've, we've also split, um, you know, the boom, the boom entrance where the cars come in, to actually split that into three sections, very clearly marked with, um, with tape, so that uh, an arrow is coming from blue, from orange and yellow coming in through the center. So we've even actually just divided a, a one big car gate into all three entrances. We had one facility who got their maintenance department, got approval, got their maintenance department come, come and um, 
cut a hole in the fence and added an extra added an extra exit. So there really are a lot of options. Depends how motivated the team is. So here's a clinical question for me, actually, uh, on collection of sputum. So I think it's very clear. There's a very um, some very nice articles coming out now. I even read one this morning about the the best samples to take. And so it's worth covering that here um, again. So the best sample you can take is sputum, um, better than a swab of any kind. So if your patient is producing sputum, regardless of whether you're taking sputum for TB, that's not relevant. If your patient is producing sputum, and that's not a dry cough with some saliva, but um, producing sputum from their lungs, then that's your, your optimal specimen. You can send it in a normal, the same jar you would send a TB specimen in, um, and you don't need to use a swab, um, and the patient can produce their own sputum away from you. So that's, that is ideal, um, not just for TB patients. The next best is a nasopharyngeal swab, and then lastly, an oropharyngeal swab. And actually, the drop-off in sensitivity when you move from nasopharyngeal to oropharyngeal is actually quite significant, which we're, we're, we're learning now. And that's a question for the people supplying the swabs, um, that we need to put pressure on them to to procure nasopharyngeal swabs for those patients who can't produce sputum. But if all you have is oropharyngeal, then that's what you have to do. Um, who did our... Oh, sorry. Okay, who did our paint markings? We did, they were done by ourselves and our volunteers using some donated road paint. But the, in Johannesburg, the Johannesburg Roads Authority, I think it's called, um, have agreed to come to clinics to assist. So you may well be able to get uh, people to come and assist you with markings outside of your building. I think the, que so the question is why. Um, it's very, oh, it's, why? Ve it's very Not important. Who, it's very important that this, this entire patient flow is marked on the ground. It really helps patients because there's not always somebody to explain exactly what they need to do. We've also worked out that patients, um, and, and to be honest, our healthcare workers' understanding of how far 1.5 meters isn't, isn't that great. And so it really, really helps when it's marked on the ground. It's much more easy, it's much easier to cue Marshall, especially for outside. Yeah, okay, so I'm moving on to the open questions. Um, I think it's very important to ensure cross ventilation in a series of tents in orange zone. You don't want to expose. Yes, I think, I mean, I agree with you. That's a more comment than a question. We definitely want as much ventilation, and that's why we're using gazebos and open sided tents. So, very much so. How can the health facility building be used for this model? With winter coming outside, it's not advisable um, other than for COVID screening, TB and testing. So I think, again, we've answered this, that the, if you can keep the orange and the blue separate, then you can use the inside of the building. Um, but we, what we, this is going to be happening in the winter when it's cold. And so that's one reason for trying to procure um, solid tents with sides. And so that uh, the, although we, the orange zone might be in the car park, it will be as protected from the elements as possible. Uh, just to add to that, I think you're completely right, though, for the blue zone. So a lot of the facilities are doing external um, refill pickups. And the more we ensure that the blue zone is safe, that patients, that there's not as many patients, that we've separated, separated out our symptomatic patients, and that patients are seated a reasonable distance from each other, we can then um, ensure that those services go back into the facility buildings when it's cold. Um, I can answer, I mean, they're not clinical questions, but I can answer, um, we, yeah, we, somebody um, was translating Madeleine Muller, actually, who's one of the people who, who was part of this, is, uh, is in the Eastern Cape, and uh, if, if somebody can produce a translation into Tosa, then we can get the, the posters translated into Tosa. The person, Jean Elphick, who did the posters, is, is um is happy to do a course of version if you could pr provide the translation. Are these guidelines endorsed by NDOH and Provincial Departments of Health? Um, we're working on endorsement. I don't know if anyone else wants to com comment on that. Bonnie's, Bonnie already answered this question in the beginning. 
They right. have been endorsed by Johannesburg District. District is um, the, the district both local and provincial authorities have signed them off for implementation in Johannesburg. They have been uh, presented to the Gauteng Provincial Department who is thinking about it. Um, we haven't had the capacity or time uh, to take it up to national department for consideration and endorsement. I think Bonnie was discussing that among some of the partners who might be able to support that process. Hi, I'm Bonnie here. Can you hear me all right? Yeah. Yes. Okay, great. Um, just to follow up, I mentioned, made mention of this at the start of the session today. Um, that again, we don't, with this training, it's meant to be additional support to anything that your provinces are already doing. It's not meant to be in any contradiction. So please use this just as an additional support, um, additional resources you can use to ready your facilities. Um, we will continue to advocate for national endorsement. Um, but again, if your provinces have already proceeded with their own training on this and their own way of going about this, please always follow the coordination and lead of your province and districts. Thanks. Okay. So I think we've discussed uh, disinfecting chairs. There needs to be a, someone allocated to clean chairs in the orange zone. Um, that can be a cleaner or it can be one of the community health worker robots. Uh, I'll, uh, discussing the patient flow system. I think it's really, really important that um, if your system is set up correctly, the flow will be relatively quick. And when I say this, uh, we have managed to, uh, when there was no triaging happening, uh, the patients in the facility in this big CHC were pretty much finished by half past 11, 12 o'clock. And with the whole process in place, we've actually been able to bring that down by half an hour. So um, please don't think that this slows down the queue. If it's, if it's being managed properly, the flow through the um, yellow section should be fast and very quickly managed. And really the purpose is to ensure that patients can flow into that blue zone as per normal, as quickly as possible without clogging up at the gate. That's why we don't want to add additional um, triage or processes in the yellow zone. We want people to flow into blue as quickly as possible. Um, and we're able to then separate out the orange patients and manage the patients within orange. It should not slow down your service if it is implemented appropriately. Okay, how many patients were HIV tested? Some Lynn can probably answer this. I think, I think in Alex yesterday, it was about five of the 20 to 30, 20 or so, maybe. Yeah, I'd say ours were the same, the same. Obviously, some people coming into Orange already know that they're positive, so we don't need to test them. We already know their status. Those are the only, only the people that um, have not previously been tested or are not willing to acknowledge that they have been previously tested. So it's a, it's a fairly small proportion of the patients coming through. We do have art patients coming through into Orange. Uh, regarding the sense of smell, it, it's I'm not going to go into the pathophysiology now uh, because it's easy to read about, but it does seem to be to coming out very strongly as a specific marker of COVID that the virus is a neurotropic virus and it seems to affect the olfactory um, area um, very early on. So uh, there's lots of places you can read about that, but it does seem to be coming through very strongly and which is why it's likely to be in the national guideline. And even though um, we're not testing those people, we want those people to isolate until that um, symptom goes away. Um, can common meds be kept in the orange zone? Absolutely. So the orange zone meds, again, it, 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 it liaises with the pharmacist, your pharmacist. Um, the, we talked about paracetamol and what people call flu packs and amoxicillin. Um, but in some facilities, they're keeping a whole range of medications in the orange zone, uh, chronic medications. And so they're being dispensed directly from that orange tent rather than a runner going to pharmacy. So liaise with your pharmacist. If, you've got a, if, you, uh, if you can make that work, then please do. Is there any opportunity in these changing times to recommend that all known chronics be sent refills to homes or use lockers? Community? Okay, but Lynn is an expert on this area. <laughs> I think, to be honest, we're on the phone with many experts on this area in PEPFAR. As far as I understand, that is being implemented. CCMDD has implemented an option where you can request home delivery of your medicine 
They're also setting up additional community pickup points. I think one observation that I can make from the uh, visiting the various facilities over the last two weeks is that quite a lot of the big facilities in Joburg now have the sharp left containers. Those sharp left containers really could be maximized in use. Uh, we have very few patients coming through to those. Uh, we, don't, we don't need to discuss the reasons, but they are not being um, uh, optimi optimally used at this point. But yes, absolutely, as much as we can move out into the community, those are the national guidelines that when a patient comes for a facility reform model that we advise the patient that they consider rather moving to an outer facility model. So either the external pickup points or even the community adherence clubs, but the community adherence clubs during COVID will not be used as um, group format uh, differentiated service delivery model, but rather as an individual model where each patient will individually um, approach the lay healthcare worker who will dispense their treatment. We definitely want to move as many in-facility patients to out-of-facility models. We also want to make sure that when patients in the blue zone are attending the art service, that they are evaluated for um, decanting or for, uh, for moving into differentiated service delivery models. The National Department has, has endorsed that now happening at six months on treatment if you're stable. Absolutely, we want to move our stable um, art patients out of facility. We want to give them the longest refill possible. And really from our observations, if patients are still wanting to attend in facility, we could be maximizing the sharp left containers that are on the facility grounds, which at the moment are staffed, but are having very few patients uh, attending. Sorry, and I just want to contribute there, Bonnie, from USAID again. Um, I just want to piggyback on everything that's been said and then to make it very clear that USAID really enforces that all partners, please, please continue decanting as much as possible. Um, now is the time and we are, we have committed to the South African government that we will push our partners to continue fast tracking decanting as much as possible. Okay, here's a, here's a clinical question for me. So someone who tests is negative, and so they would be then be coming back a few days later, I think is what you're suggesting, because the, the testing is, they won't be tested that day. So if someone comes back, they still have symptoms and they've had a negative test, that is an interesting area because we know the tests are not perfect, um, any of the tests. So I would suggest that if someone is still screens positive because their symptoms are still less than 14 days and had a negative test, I would suggest that the, they still go to Orange Area and are assessed and not immediately assumed to be negative and the clinician has to make an assessment. We don't routinely want to be retesting people over and over but I think we have to be cognizant that um, particularly if someone had an oral swab and it was negative and they come back and their symptoms have worse, worsened that we may want to that it would generally be a better idea to keep them in the orange zone and consider a retest rather than send them into the blue area. Um, yeah, we if we had a perfect had, test, that would be easy, but we don't. Sorry, we also had this raised uh, when we were supporting Hillbrow as to whether if a patient came with, so non-symptomatic, but came with a negative result, whether they needed, well, let's not say non-symptomatic, if they came with a negative result, so they had it on their SMS or they had a piece of paper to say they'd been COVID tested, whether they needed to be screened again, we made it very clear that obviously it depends how old that result is because you can become infected subsequent to your last test. So, you know, unless you've really been tested the day before, you should re be rescreened. Yeah. Um, the next question is about service delivery. So, um, all, all services, child health, immunization, ANC, are as per the guide. So, if you screen blue, you have them done in the blue area. And if you screen orange, you have them done in the orange area. So none, all of those services are, are carrying on, um, but divided by the two areas. I hope that answers that question. Also, I mean, one of the most complicating, uh, complicated set of questions we get at the facilities are, are around how we manage children. Uh, we know that uh, many children that come to our facilities display one of these symptoms, and that makes it problematic. We've said that... Um, uh, the caregiver attending with the child, if either one is symptomatic, then the entire unit needs to go to orange. So the caregiver with the child. 
if you're getting huge children numbers coming through, uh, one of the facilities that we supported have decided to set up in the orange zone a separate IMCI station so that they can um, so that they can work through the children coming in with symptoms as quickly as possible and get them out of the orange zone and home. But that's very much a, a facility decision whether they have the capacity to do that. Okay, clinical question, a PUI test HV positive on the same day as test and COVID testing, do we delay ART? So yes, because the patient is needs to be tested for TB before they start ART. So, um, by de so they, by definition of being orange, they essentially have a positive TB screen. And so we don't start ART on the, pa on the patients who have positive TB screen until we've had a TB test. Now it's, what we should do is um, we can take a CD4 count and a CRAG and attend a TB test and attend a TB test. And if any of those are positive, we can call the patient back. But otherwise, we should wait 14 days, um, and by which time the patient will no longer be a COVID PUI and start art after after 14 days. We do not want patients come with symptoms of COVID coming back um, for art start within 14 days unless it's absolutely necessary. How long post possible exposure can one take a test? Well, I think you're. I think what you're asking is what is the incubation period? So the incubation period is 14 days, the maximum. It's a range from about two days to 14 days with a median of about five or six days. So the reason the quarantine period is 14 days is because you can become positive anything up to 14 days. So whilst a negative test at seven days is helpful, it doesn't absolutely rule out. Um, COVID. Yeah, yeah, the next question is about the, yeah, we do think that, I mean, the important thing is that we try and set up these systems so that they're sustainable in the long term. For many, we've been suggesting that that might meet temporary plans immediately using gazebos, etc., while um, plans are made for procurement of um, alternatives. I don't think we're going to get away from at least a um, strong fixed tent. If you look at the video that's provided on the hospital setting, you'll see the difference between what we mean by a fixed uh, solid tent versus a gazebo. Really, this is the way we're wanting to go in the bigger facilities. It's much more durable, much more manageable during um, uh, winter windy seasons. But you know this, this unfortunately requires procurement processes through provincial uh, provincial structures. Okay, this is a, this is too long to answer the whole question. Sensitivity and specificity of tests in symptomatic and asymptomatic patients. Uh, although there, uh, I, I can send you some documents on this. Um, in summary, the the specificity of tests is very strong, unless you're trying to test somebody who's just recovered. And then you may get a false positive because they've still got a viral RNA. Anyone who understands expert knows that you get false positives in previously treated expert patients. It's the same concept. The sensitivity is variable, um, but in summary, the highest sensitivity is for sputum. Um, it's outside of a hospital at, a, at around um, 80 plus percent. Um, then nasopharyngeal swabs in the 60 to 70 percent then oropharyngeal swabs can be as low as 50%. Um, and that's, that's the answer. You transport sputum um, as you would transport the swabs um, at room temperature in a standard sputum jar. Um, next question, doesn't, does not require ice. So it's the same as a swab, dry swab. Uh, I don't know what call for care is. Does call for care not form part of facility preparedness? I'm not sure what that is. So on um, the question around six month dispensing, no, you'll see the um, the national department has um, has endorsed two months dispensing uh, with consideration for three months dispensing if the patient's on TLD because the TLD uh, stock is less threatened. Uh, if that hasn't been circulated, please uh, read the national guideline as to uh, the dispensing period. What we are suggesting, though, is that patients are scripted for the full six months, but the supply period uh, follows the national guideline guidance on this. 
Uh, can somebody be reinfected? Okay, it's not really on facility preparedness. The answer is nobody's quite sure. Um, and it's a, a active research question. Um, for what it's worth, um, my, my opinion is that viruses that are self-limiting, i.e. the body is able to fight them off with its own antibodies, almost always provide some degree of protection. Um, it's only, only things uh, that, that don't, uh, the body can't clear where that doesn't happen, like HIV. So um, I, I, my hunch is that, 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 that at a minimum, people will get a one year of protection from reinfection, but nobody knows. Um, baseline COVID testing for health workers. Yes, we're recommending strongly that all healthcare workers have a test, one test, um, and we're doing that at our facilities. And that, so that includes the next question about orange zone workers. But the, one of the questions frequently asked is how often? There is no guidance on how often. Um, I'm, I'm picking a, a number out of the air and saying every month, but you could equally, if you had the, uh, you could equally say two weeks, and uh, it depends on resources. Yeah, it's a, uh, we, so just to let you know, so in, at least in uh, Gauteng, it has been um, uh, endorsed that all healthcare workers, uh, include, obviously including asymptomatic healthcare workers, should be tested. Uh, managing that, especially in the big facilities, is not easy. I mean, just at the at Stratford CHC with all the robots and all the facility staff, that's around 250 staff that need to be tested. So, you know, the more frequently you do that, that is a big own, uh, onus on the orange zone, on the testing stations. What we've done to try and process all of those healthcare workers is, uh, and, and this is, I think, really important, is that we separate patient um, testing hours from uh, healthcare workers. On the first day, unfortunately, the healthcare workers from the facility came and really wanted to be tested at the same time that we had symptomatic patients in the orange zone. We've, we've managed to sort that out, but we really strongly recommend that um, patients uh, in the orange zone be cleared, all of them tested, the area disinfected, and then the afternoons when there's very limited patient flow in the facilities be used for healthcare worker testing. Um, that then can be um, sped up by the healthcare workers completing their own forms, because that takes a long time, um, so that the uh, the healthcare workers that are able to complete all the forms, including all their contacts, complete their forms and possibly support um, lower, lower level cadres that might struggle with the forms. That speeds up the process. So you already arrive for testing with your forms completed. We then able to set up a separate, separate outside testing station for two, two, with two or three testers if you have more people trained and really try to process your healthcare workers as quickly as possible. Um, COVID results, patients should not be coming back for COVID results. They should be contacted telephonically. Um, there is um, supposed to be a follow-up system so that they can be contact traced. Um, I, I'm not able to answer exactly how that works. I'm not going to try. Yeah, and we don't, uh, we, uh, the system at the moment as it's set up doesn't allow the facility to um, follow up with the patients because all of the forms are submitted with a result, with a specimen, and so therefore then go through to um, NICD, who then deals with the various command centers, who then deal with the various districts to do the, the, tra the, inf the informing the patients and the contact tracing. The system might need to be revised really so that um, there's a duplicate form at the facility which allows the facility to also uh, trace the patients. Um, Candice, will we be supporting outside COJ? Um, we are making ourselves as available as possible next week. Um, personally, I'm going to move into the hospitals within COJ, um, and we will certainly attempt to support everyone that we can. Perhaps someone else can answer how much time we've got. I mean, I suppose uh, that we, we're not we're not personally we wouldn't be able to do it in person because we're not in person, and there's only. Uh, three or four of us doing the training, but it's very, e you know, we've said this before, that by t it really has to be sort of a train the trainer approach. We're very happy um, to set up more trainings within COJ or even virtually, um, but then once you train that you feel comfortable to continue that training elsewhere in the country. We really want to use the model CHCs, that's why we put so much effort into them, so that other facilities can come on the training tour 
where you can actually um, explain as you're going around and showing the various stations at a facility that sets up properly. We've, we've really observed that um, virtual training or training um, in a boardroom um, is far less effective uh, than actually doing and showing. So uh, disinfecting gazebos. So um, you don't, a gazebo, the, it, the virus is where people touch. So people don't touch the roof of a, of a gazebo. They might cough onto it, but then they don't touch it. So I would recommend that the roof of a gazebo is, is disinfected at the end of every day. The poles of a gazebo, you, I would, people should not be touching, but it will be, people probably will touch them. So it would be advisable to have your cleaner disinfect the poles um, relatively frequently. And where there are sides, those would similarly need to be disinfected. Yeah. Great. Thank you so much, um, Tom and Lynn, for answering all of those questions. Um, and I just want to wrap up here. We have five minutes left. Um, so first and foremost, thank you so much for your time, Tom, Lynn, and Anna. Um, I think this has been incredibly useful. I just want to reiterate a few of the messages that I said in the beginning of the call. Um, one is that, again, this is meant to be additional resources to support you. Please, again, you are serving at the hands and in coordination with your DOH counterparts. So please follow their guidance for your district or province that you work in. I also wanna say that this is a time to be resourceful and innovative, to work with your districts and with your municipalities to get your sites ready. So while you, I know that every site is really different in terms of how it's structured, um, the space that you have. I've seen all sorts of sites in this country and I think it's a time to be resourceful and to work with what you've got and to work with your um, other sectors to see what can more can be provided. I also wanna say that if you have any questions about procuring anything for site setup that you're not so sure of, please speak to your leadership so that they can engage directly with your AORs on any questions that you might have around what you may or need to procure additionally um, and how this could be done if there is anything. Lastly, I'm, I will speak to Lynn and Tom and Anna offline, but I think we will probably set up a follow-up session so that you can come back to this forum with more Q&A um, after you've started implementing some of these things in your site so that we can hear more about how it's going. We can look at photos with you and explore any concerns that you might have. So we will try to set up another session like that. Again, all of these materials are available to you so that you can do further training with your teams. Um, and then if there's a need for any additional training from Lynn and Tom specifically, please liaise with me directly and we'll try to set that up if they have the capacity to do so. But again, this is meant to be more of train the trainer. I like the idea of setting up kind of centers for excellence. So if you can focus on a couple of CHCs in your geography as a starting point and get them right, sharing pictures directly with Tom and Lynn to see if you're on track, um, then you could follow a similar approach to setting them up as models. So thank you so much again, everyone. Lynn and Tom, do you have any other closing remarks? I just saw a question which I think um, was put up and then taken down about the age of people working in the orange zone. Uh, I, I don't know the official guidance on this, but I'm going to give you my two penneth because I think it's important. Um, clearly, people at risk of, uh, of significant illness with COVID are people who are older and people who have comorbidities. Um, and it's challenging to know about the comorbidities of HIV because of disclosure, but age um, is, is relatively easy. And um, I certainly would not be, I'm not comfortable with people over the age of, I'm gonna say 55 working in the orange zone. We know that everyone's at risk, but those people are more at risk. And I would discourage people from asking um, anyone over the age of around 55 or who, who um, will disclose their comorbidities to working in the orange zone. Great, thanks, Tom. Anything further from you, Lynn? Nope, just thanks very much. And uh, it's, it's a lot of work and we need to get going. Um, and lockdown's coming to an end and we need to make sure that our facilities, as soon as, uh, well, already, but as soon as lockdown's done, um, that they're safe for our patients. And so this really is a massive priority. Great, thank you so, so much and stay well, everyone. <laughs>